it's uh, funny enough that we're starting on a timely manner in a time series forecasting uh, talk. So before I begin, I would like to ask, well, first of all, thank you for being here, and then ask the audience, uh, who of you know what uh, time series are from the audience? Great. And who is currently working on time series problems, forecasting or anomaly detection, classification? Great. So more or less the half of it. So I hope uh, during this talk, during the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, to tell you a story that hopefully will entertain you. Uh, and it's a story about uh, two mountains, two big mountains, and uh, a cliff between of them. And then it's a story about how we at Nixla are trying to cross that bridge or build uh, that bridge between those two, uh, two, those two, those two different families. So I'm going to start by introducing the field, what's, what time series are, why they are useful. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the first month or the first problem, namely classical methods in statistical forecasting. And then afterwards, I'm going to introduce the second month, namely deep learning or newer machine learning uh, methods in, in the field. Uh, the development of the story will be presented at the fourth point when we try to cross and we attempt to bridge those two different uh, opposites. And at the end, Hopefully, I'm going to entertain you with some more adventures of uh, the Nixla team. So what, what, why time series and why are they important or useful? Uh, we do believe that the operational DNA of the world is time series data. So financial data, electric data, IoT data, it's all mapped in, in tabular form. And most of it, and most of the times, it comes as a, a data that is indexed across uh, times or sampled across different regular intervals of time. So the applications are really uh, huge, but uh, some of the most classical ones are uh, electricity demand forecasting, electricity price forecasting, trying to optimize supply chains by being able to forecast millions of different items across locations, across categories. Uh, but obviously, healthcare data, uh, time series data is also quite important in healthcare. Uh, and recently, we have seen an explosion of uh, use cases in telemetry and observability data. So uh, some, some folks, folks are using Nixla and time series technology to detect anomalies, for example, to identify uh, certain anomalies in, in past data and to try to predict anomalies in future data. Formally speaking, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is quite easy. We're trying to, to solve uh, this multivariate uh, regression problem where we are going to use uh, historical data and exogenous variables. So basically, what we're trying to do here uh, on the right side of the equation is to forecast certain horizons based entirely on past observation. So it's, it's, it's on the one side, it's very simple. On the other side, it's quite complicated in, in terms of the past is not always a good predictor of the future. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But nevertheless, the future as an uncertain outcome that it is, it's, it's, it's always good to be able to reduce that uncertainty about the future. And that's more or less how we understand uh, our, our task as time series practitioners. So that's, that's the setting. And now in the setting, we have two important players or two families or two mountains as, as, we, as we introduced. On the one side, we have uh, traditional methods. The field was developed mainly by statisticians and, and mathematicians and econometricians who applied uh, and developed these methods to forecast uh, the market, the stock market, who tried to uh, uh, use it for, like, for example, predicting inflation and trying to take seasonality away from, from, from inflation. And some very interesting models arose uh, from that uh, specific tradition. Uh, you probably have used them, have heard of them, Arima, Naive, Garch, Exponential Smoothing. But that tradition is well and alive. People are still developing classical statistical uh, methods. Uh, most prominently, the field is advanced by, by certain people around the Monash University, namely Rob Hinman, who has permanently uh, developed a lot of uh, libraries and solutions for the R ecosystem. Uh, there has also there, there have been also newer models like for example the complex exponential smoothing which uh, was published uh, I think last year so the field is well and alive but on the other side uh, uh, deep learning and machine learning also uh, had an interesting development in the time series field and some people started developing uh, neural networks deep neural networks and some classical models arose in that 
particular tradition, namely LSTM and, and recently more uh, transformer-based methods. One interesting part about the story is that the both families don't really like each other that much. They constantly <laughs> attack uh, each other, they constantly uh, criticize each other, and if you uh, take a look and participate in social media. They do like Twitter a lot, they do like LinkedIn a lot, and they are very expressive about the failures of the other ones. So you have uh, statisticians claiming that the deep learning is, is just a, a hoax and it doesn't really work for tabular data or for time series data, and you have deep learning practitioners saying that statisticians are not really leveraging the power of newer technologies and newer computation. You even have interesting uh, change of minds inside the same family. So for example, the same title with the same authors at different times propose different things. That's, that's regular in the field, that happens in the time series field, and certain people have grown very frustrated and made or are making very funny comments about the difference between, for example, computer vision and LLP and, and the field in, in tabular data. But we came to talk about the Nixlaverse and, and that's how the talk was announced. So what is the Nixlaverse? And probably the best answer is that the Nixlaverse is our attempt to, to contribute to the time series field and hoping to make a living out of it. So it arose from the, from the love that we have for uh, useful open, soft, uh, open source software, and that's what we're doing at Nixla. Philosophy aside, the Nixlaverse is a collection of uh, libraries uh, that help time series practitioners to achieve different goals. We're trying to uh, do really a fundamental program in the sense that we are trying to solve statistical methods. We're offering those. I'm going to talk about that particular library in a moment. We're also uh, trying to do research in neural forecasting method, methods, but we also have classical ML uh, uh, forecasting. We have a hierarchical forecasting. We have a trying to develop. We're trying to develop uh, automated pipelines for people with less familiarity uh, with data science in general and. Uh, more recently, we have been exploring the development and application of transfer learning to uh, the time series field. So let's begin our story with the first mountain and how we are trying to uh, live with, uh, with that tradition. So what we decided was to create stats forecast, and stats forecast is trying to bridge another gap, namely the gap that existed between the R ecosystem, which was a very good uh, developed in, in, in the time series field for classical methods and the Python ecosystem. So we developed uh, what we think is the fastest and most accurate uh, implementations of many classical algorithms, uh, for example, Autorima and ETS for, from Rob, but we also have included newer methods like the complex exponentials mooted by, by, by Ivan and recent and more newer models like the MSTL. We haven't announced this, we're gonna announce it soon, but now you can, plot, uh, you can predict uh, and train models for multiple seasonality inside of the stats forecast and uh, we're about to release this week also uh, four newer models of the Theta family which have also been proven to be quite successful in the M3 competitions. One, one thing that we're trying to make different to the other wonderful libraries that are out there is that we designed this having scalability in mind from the very beginning. So Stats Forecast offers, uh, through the support of Uke, out of the box uh, compatibility with Spark, Task, and Ray. So it's really very easy to do forecasting at scale and training hundreds and thousands of millions or of series. You can also do anomaly detection. Uh, you have probabilistic forecasting. We, we are trying to copy one of the projects that we admire the most in terms of the API and the syntax, namely uh, sklearn, scikit-learn, uh, with the dot .fit, dot .predict uh, methods. Uh, we also have a wide variety of, of other models for intermittent forecasting, a whole family of Croston models, uh, Adida, Imapa. And finally, and this is very important for us, a very large battery of uh, benchmarking models or baseline models where you can really compare if your attempts at doing or solving a specifically forecasting task are really generating value or are below a uh, classical uh, historic average or seasonal naive, which, which, which sounds maybe ridiculous, but uh, for those of you who have worked in retail, sometimes <laughs> seasonal naive, it's better than very sophisticated models. And, and sometimes we don't want to admit that, but I think, and, and, and we at the team do believe that, that sometimes simple is, is better. And that's one of the motivations behind uh, stats forecast. 
here are some numbers, but basically what we want to show you is that you can uh, do uh, like benchmark at scale. You can train 10 million of series in less than 43 minutes and spending less than $20, and you would have a nice table with a, a, a huge amount of, of, of baselines to, to beat. So as a, as a sparring partner, this, this uh, benchmarking at scale service, it's, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, you can also include exogenous variables, uh, you can include prediction intervals for certain models, uh, and we have done certain benchmarks. Uh, you can reproduce them. One of the things that we really like is, uh, or try doing, is making every claim uh, backable by empirical evidence. So if you go to the repositories and run the experiments, you should be able to reproduce this. Probably you have to fix the, the versions because those libraries are also evolving. Uh, recently, for example, Profit did some updates and is faster. Uh, still, like uh, it's, it's, it's uh, we think it still has uh, like uh, some some work uh, to catch up. But well, as you can see, it's 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 faster and more accurate than than many prominent libraries. And this is because from the very beginning we decided to, to tackle this problem uh, uh, and trying to optimize it as much as possible. So uh, most of the things are compiled through Kumba just in time with Numba, sorry, which makes it very very fast. And it has this out of the box implementations with different uh, metrics. So after developing this library, we wanted to test it against one of the most uh, famous uh, time series libraries out there, Profit, which was developed by uh, Facebook back in the day. And it's a very fancy library, and a lot of people are using it. It has more than, I think, 20,000 stars on GitHub. But uh, if you actually run the numbers and try to predict across a benchmark, a set of benchmark data sets like M3, M4, Tourism, which are very classical data sets in the time series field, you will realize that an ARIMA, a classical ARIMA developed in the 60s, can be 70% more accurate and uh, almost 40 times faster. And this does matter because a lot of enterprises around the world are trusting that the new hot technology might be better than the old classical uh, tradition, which is problematic because, uh, for example, for this experiment, we paid uh, $10 in computational time in AWS credits uh, running the Autorima experiments, and we paid almost $300 using the, uh, the profit implementation. So it's, it's not only worse in terms of accuracy, it's really orders of magnitude more expensive, which uh, it's costing it's costing us money and it's, it's, it's idle time that one well, it's time that shouldn't be used computing so here again what we are trying to, to show is that new is not always better and that uh, big names are not always better so do 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 the job that is necessary and go back to the basics and maybe start uh, uh, with some with some classical benchmarks um, so in conclusion for from this first side of the story we do think that statistical models are a very good baseline we do think that sometimes statistical models are all you need. Uh, and uh, we do believe that Stats Forecast does offer a robust alternative for benchmarking at scale with proven models. We also believe that it's easy. Uh, here you can see how to train uh, different models in, in less than 10 lines. So basically, you just have to import the libraries, select the models that you want to use out of the very large battery, and you just pass that list of models uh, to the stats forecast class. Uh, you define the data frame, define the frequency, uh, uh, specify some, some settings in the, in the parallelization, and uh, with a forecast method, you can do forecasting at scale in less than 10 lines with many different uh, models. So great, but what about the, the, the other side of the story? So uh, if, there, if this were uh, families, probably our mother would be the right side where, where we have the, the strict but caring side of statistics and math. And on the right side is our, our father, who is uh, probably loving and more permissive in, in, the, in, the, in the deep learning side. And we want to bring them uh, together. We want to bring those two families together. So what are we doing and why? why uh, care about the right side and deep learning if statistics is so great? Well, deep learning does indeed offer uh, benefits over uh, statistical methods and over classical uh, machine learning uh, methods in, so, in, in so sometimes. So three of the main advantages of the deep learning methods are uh, that in some cases it does improve accuracy significantly, as we will see uh, particularly for, for example, long horizon uh, problems. 
It does make pipelines simpler, a lot simpler than machine learning pipelines where you have to care a lot about feature engineering and feature creation, and it's very scalable. Uh, one of the main difference between statistical methods and deep learning methods is that deep learning don't fit local models. You have global models that make the very, uh, or have very nice, very nice features. Also one of the very exciting applications of, exciting applications of deep learning for time series is the possibility of implementing transfer learning uh, in the field, solving the zero shot problem. So imagine you have a, you're a retailer and you have a product that don't have history because they are new products, a new line of jeans, a new line of, 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 of a, a whatever piece of clothing, but you want to somehow predict what's going to happen. Classical models need always uh, to go back and see at the history. With deep learning, you can uh, do transfer learning and uh, solve that zero shot problem, for example. That's, that's a very exciting thing. And and, and regardless of uh, what we think are the main advantages of deep learning, uh, empirical evidence in the last uh, M competitions has shown that uh, deep learning has a very good shot at being a, a top performing in, in time series. So if you look at the M4 and M5 competitions, you will see that some uh, deep learning methods have, have really performed very, very well. And those methods uh, and making those methods available in a scalable and user-friendly way is what we were trying to do and are trying to do in the neural forecasting uh, package of, of the Nixl ecosystem. And here the features are, uh, you can also include exogenous variables, you can also uh, have forecast interpretability with certain families of models, I'm going to talk about that in a, mem in a minute. Uh, I think, yeah, it's basic. You can do probabilistic forecasting, uh, you have, can do uh, different uh, error metrics, automatic model selection. We, we made it so that it's very easy for new users to do auto uh, RNNs or auto LSTMs where you can like uh, do hyperparameter optimization over a space of different uh, configurations. It has a simple interface, it has the exact same interface as the stats forecast library and it has a wide collection of deep learning models, MLP, uh, MLPs, LSTMs, uh, uh, RNNs, uh, dilated RNNs, uh, models from the end bits, end heats, yes, yes, RNN, and, and a lot of the former uh, family models. Um, so that's that's the other side of the story. But now, how do we how do we bridge it? How do we establish like a link between those two big traditions? And and why do we need a link? And and the answer is that neural networks are indeed powerful and flexible, but they are not always uh, interpretable. They are uh, very often hard to, to, to understand. And, and we do believe that under, uh, interpretability, it's, it's important in the, in the field. And that's why we, uh, uh, and that's how we started trying to build this, that bridge. We, we, we tried to follow the path of uh, people that we admire a lot, namely uh, Boris Oreshkin and uh, Joshua Benjo team, who started developing one of the first uh, uh, attempts to solve that bridge between the two mountains, which is the NBITS model. And the NBITS model has performed well in different competitions, but it's also quite interesting in the sense that it aligns itself in the tradition of signal decomposition. So it's not only a neural network model, it also offers the possibility to decompose the signal in classical elements like trend and seasonalities, which are uh, very important to understand if you are trying to make important decisions based on, on the forecast. And what we were doing back then as, as researchers is to expand the end bits uh, and to include exogenous variables in the end bits to make it even better. And we published a paper called NBITS X, X stands for exogenous variables, and indeed uh, accuracy was improved uh, significantly. But we uh, realized that there were some problems. And, and the problems that we realized is when we started doing long horizon forecasting with classical methods and with the end bits, we realized that it, it was very bad, that accuracy and, and complexity grew. Everyone, accuracy decreased and complexity grew. So we started looking into this distant future and tried to figure out a way to solve the long horizon problem. And, and why is it a problem? Why, why, why is long horizon a problem? Namely, uh, uh, you have a very like poor uh, trade-off between bias and variance. If you use classical statistical methods, you have very high bias. If you try going with newer machine learning or deep learning models, you have more variance. And in both cases, you suffer from a lot of computational complexity. 
And why? Because there are two ways of approximating long horizon forecasting. One of them is the classical sequential predictions, namely you predict t plus one, and then you use t plus one to predict two plus two, and so on. And, and this, is, this is a very bad idea if you have long horizons because it concatenates the errors, right? So if, if you start deviating a little bit and you end up very far away from the signal. So a classical alternative is to use what's called multi-step predictions where you try to forecast the whole horizon at once. And, and this is in terms of accuracy better, but uh, it, also, it also has certain problems, namely that performance does, uh, performance in terms of accuracy does uh, grow very fast in relation to the horizon, as you can see there in the graph on the left. And also, uh, on the graph on the right, you can see how the number of parameters grows significantly and very fast in relation to the horizon. So the problem with the classical methods is that, uh, or, or the, even the deep learning methods, is that they are not accurate, they, they are highly complex, and they are uh, uh, highly uh, uh, or very slow. So what's the solution? And, and we started thinking and, and came up with this idea uh, 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 that in, in principle is very simple, namely reduce the problem. So let's go with a multi-step approach, but let's start taking pieces of the middle. So instead of having the whole multi-step horizon, let's take every second observation away, or every third one, or every uh, n amount of observations, and interpolate between those two observations. And that intuition of interpolating between a multi-step approach is what we tried to develop in the end its uh, architecture, where we uh, combine this multi-rate signal sampling and hierarchical interpolation with uh, the techniques that we learned from the NBITS architecture. So what we are doing uh, intuitively is uh, we, we fix the, the, the multi-step horizon and then we have different amount of, of, of points. The fewer the points, the higher, uh, the, the lower the frequency and, and the more points we have, the higher the frequency. And what the neural network is doing here, what the, what the NHITS architecture is doing, is every stack is learning a different frequency. So at the beginning, the, the distance between the points is bigger and then we start learning the different uh, frequencies of the, of the signal. And, and some of you uh, might recognize a similar image from, from, from your math classes where, uh, or your physics classes, and it does have indeed a relation to, to the Fourier transform. And we wanted to explore that idea, so we tried to, to, to show, and we, we, we did, and, and you can read it in the paper, we show how the NHITS can perfectly reconstruct uh, harmonic signals from synthetic data, demonstrating that indeed the NHITS and that intuition of doing uh, sampling and then interpolating it does indeed help uh, the model specialize uh, and learn different frequencies in different stacks. So now the, the big question is, should we, should we or can we apply this to real uh, world data? Is this extensible to, to, to actual data set? So if it was, and, and to motivate the idea, it would be great because we could take one signal and, and the end hits would do something very similar uh, to the classical models, and it would decompose the signal in familiar elements like trend, uh, seasonalities, and, and that would be indeed a, a huge advancement for, for interpretability in neural network methods. So we went out and tested this against many different data sets, uh, long horizon data sets, electricity transformer temperature, exchange rates, electricity load, even the San Francisco Bay Area highway traffic, and other data sets. And, uh, uh, amazingly, the, the NHITS did uh, very well. It did perform good on real, on real data. It showed a 25% improvement over the best paper award of uh, AAAI 2021, which is relevant in the field because it was one of the first times that transformer-based methods started gaining popularity for time series. So it's, it's in summary, it's a lot more uh, accurate than transformer-based uh, methods, and it's a lot less expensive. It's 50 times uh, faster or it takes 50 times less computation. So here you can see the graphs, but I think the important question is why does this uh, matter? And, and it matters in, in a theoretical sense, or at least we think it does, and, and this is some food for thought for you, but we, we, we think we have uh, shown that the n hits uh, is indeed an expansion or has an interesting relation to the uh, Fourier transform. We also showed that the end hits is a very cool door to cool topics like wavelet transforms and, and information theory a la Shannon. And also, for example, that the end beats, uh, the model that we introduced at the beginning, is just a special case of the end hits where the, the, the length uh, between the points is, is very, very, very small. 
on the practical side, and thus this might be less, less, uh, less. Uh, this might be more, more interesting. It, it's simply a better, cheaper, easier, and simpler than a lot of other models. So, so uh, go, go and try it out, and. And, and, and we think this is really exciting, at least for us. This was mind-blowing when we came to, to this uh, conclusion. But again, uh, uh, this, this part was maybe more uh, research-related, but go out and, and test it. You simply have to import the libraries, define the models, and call it with a simple train fit uh, 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 um, syntax, and you can see how the end hits performs in your particular data sets. That being said, be wary that deep learning needs indeed more uh, manual work than, than statistics sometimes, that you do need to, to specify some good parameters. So go out, test it, and, and write us if you have any questions. And that's how we tried to bridge the, the, the gap. And, and the further adventures uh, that we wanted to present, and this is the final section of the talk, uh, we are further developed the forecasting ecosystem where we're trying to do so. We have established certain hierarchical forecasting methods where you can solve, for example, the problem on how do I reconcile forecasts at different levels of hierarchies. Imagine you're a retailer and you're forecasting products from different categories across locations from different like, counties or states or countries, and you want to reconcile them in a, in a, in a, in a coherent way. You can use these methods to do so. And we're also working on a low latency forecasting API for developers. This is intended for, for people who don't do Python and want to like uh, include forecasting into their web applications with JavaScript, React, whatever, whatever language you can imagine. And uh, uh, that's it. Uh, we would uh, like you. We would like like to invite you to to join the communities. We are uh, happy to to have more people join this this adventure and, and this. Uh, this 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 project. If you want to tweet, uh, uh, be welcome. Federico, our fourth co-founder, who couldn't be here, is going to be happy to read about your your thoughts on, in Twitter. And uh, as an open source project, we we would really like to thank the different contributors that hel have helped us do this uh, project a reality. And uh, that's it. That's that's the talk. Minutes for questions. Great. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, I just was curious, like, uh, for instance, uh, predicting uh, faults in like a manufacturing line, or in my case, I'm actually thinking about software development and build quality, and able to forecast uh, quality issues there. What quality issues in terms of potential bugs that might arise from a certain like uh, merge domain or, or potentially or a lot of times we encounter things like our, our uh, servers become overwhelmed and makes ah, okay good uh, great build, uh, and you have the similar things in manufacturing. Yeah, there, there's a certain uh, company that is uh, collecting a lot of different logs and telemetry and they want to identify what certain then behavior uh, becomes uh, atypical to, or in order to anticipate a possible failure or to provision infrastructure. And that's a classical use of uh, probabilistic forecasting. How they are doing it is they do the, the forecasting intervals, and everything that is above or below a certain uh, uh, level is considered an, an anomaly. So indeed, it, it can be applied to those specific fields that you mentioned. Thank you. work a lot more with like medical time series data. And so I was wondering, do these packages kind of handle like missingness? Because sometimes like the like, thing like lab values, sometimes those are missing. Frequency isn't, doesn't have like a regular cadence to it. It's also kind of like relatively sparse. Do these packages already handle that kind of like pre-built in? Or is that something that is like coming down the line or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, two, two of my co-founders are, are here, and I know this, this is a very like exciting topic for Kin, so maybe can you want to answer that question? So, so first on, on uh, missing values, maybe, maybe you can go, and, and then I can go with uh, frequency. <laughs> yeah, so, so the neural models here, uh, they assume full data. Um, so yeah, but uh, we are working on, on, on problems with missing data, or like when the features are different, uh, like because we know that we, we have experience on healthcare data, and sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know, one of the sensors come out, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, re regarding um, uh, changes in frequency domain, uh, uh, the end hits basically is performing a wavelet transform. 
and uh, it, it is able to um, uh, accommodate changes in the frequency of the day. So basically, it's doing almost like a Fourier transform, but localized. And uh, in that regard, it's able to, to, to uh, tackle these kind of, uh, like I would even say, like non-stationary data. Yeah. But uh, we answered two questions. So, yeah, was there another? Uh, sparseness. Oh, sparsity. And uh, we are working on um, distributional uh, methods that can basically work as a plug-in to, to neural um, methods. Basically, you change a bit the loss function and, and train, for example, a Poisson regression or a Poisson mixture on top. Uh, and such distributions are able to fit uh, sparse data. But yeah, so, so it's, it's basically like a plug-in, and, and we have them, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, have you built in, or are you planning to build in facilities for the uh, evaluation of, to f facilitate? Because, you know, different ways of validation, cross-validation, and so forth in time series yeah. tends to be a little trickier than in other domains. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. And, and the short answer is yes. Uh, one of the core uh, methods of the core class uh, in both cases is a cross-validation, where you can do different cross-validation strategies with different like windows and, 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 and step sizes. And you can like do what some people call back testing at, at scale. So, so yeah. Thank you. Sure, please. Do any of the libraries of the ecosystem support multi-seasonality at the moment? Uh, yeah, uh, the MSTL in the classical methods and the N hits in the in the neural methods. Thanks. Uh, have you thought about incorporating any of the like uh, Gaussian process approaches to uh, time series estimation? They kind of fit. They don't quite fit in like the left or the right, um, but yeah, more like a curve fitting. So we had like uh, this um, very cool idea during um, uh, last summer uh, about uh, extending the NHITS method, which is currently a point forecasting method into probabilistic world, basically by uh, using the closeness, closeness on the additivity of the Gaussian process. Basically, you can transform the NHITS into a probabilistic method and, and, and use the fact that a Gaussian process plus a Gaussian process is a Gaussian process and, and have like a long horizon uh, uh, forecasting tool. But yeah, so, so we, we, we had the thought, and then it's, a, it's a, like a immediate, it will be immediate. Right. Oh, thank yeah. you. Then I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> and if someone has more questions like that, they want to ask in, in, in a, like more private matter or whatever, we are going to be here uh, during the days and happy to, to help you. And I reiterate write, write the, the invitation to, to join the community and, and to help us make, make these libraries better and to help uh, make the, the forecasting field uh, better. Thank you very much. <laughs>